Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Rest in Christ. And this is the final lesson in that series. It's entitled The Ultimate Rest. It's lesson number 13 for September 25 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we bow now, we ask that you will guide us through studying this lesson to a closer relationship with you. May we understand something of our future as it's it spelled out in Scripture as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a world that is in upheaval. There is a battle going on between right and wrong, but that battle has its basis on something that began in heaven thousands of years ago. It is a battle over the character and government of God. Somebody wants to take over the government of God. It was won by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. We believe he won, but Satan has managed to delay the final conclusion to that great controversy by alluring so many of us to follow his ways. It is a life and death matter for him. What about us? And the great controversy is being played out on two levels. One, the cosmic universe-wide level in which everyone is involved and which Christ has already won. It involves wars, political problems, natural disasters, pandemics, and death. I mean, you can, I mean, think about this. Basically, Satan is gonna do everything he po that God will possibly allow him to do to try to mess things up. Revelation 12, 6 to 12, make it very clear how the war started and who the antagonists were. Two, but the great controversy also happens inside our minds. The battle is not out there with hard weapons and guns and swords and rockets or whatever, airplanes. It, this is a battle inside our minds. Every day there's a battle between go, doing what we selfishly want to do, following the example of Satan, and what we know from God's word we ought to do. We will face a lot of troubles, maybe even death, if Jesus doesn't come before that event in our individual lives. John, in our story for today, was the only apostle left. Many of his friends and fellow apostles had already suffered martyrdom. He himself had been through a lot of troubles, but he remembered the promise of Jesus just as he was taken up into heaven that he would come again. More than 60 years had passed since those promises had been made. The church had changed. There was a new generation of believers, and John must have felt alone, tired, and restless. He had been exiled to a lonely island called Patmos in the Aegean Sea between Turkey and Greece. And I'm very happy to say that I had the privilege of being a part of a group that traveled to the Patmos. I've been there and seen the place where they claim John was, a cave where they, they think he he received those visions. We, uh, we don't know for sure, of course. And I've also been to the place in Ephesus where they uh, believe John was actually buried. Do you think John ex exiled to that island was required to do hard labor? I mean, that's what a lot of people did there. Review a bit of John's history. Jim, you wanna take the first paragraph there? The rulers of the Jews were filled with bitter hatred against John for his unwavering fidelity to the cause of Christ. They declared that their efforts against the Christians would avail nothing so long as John's testimony kept ringing in the ears of the people. In order that the miracles and teachings of Jesus might be forgotten, the voice of the bold witness must be silenced. Gary? John was accordingly summoned to Rome to be tried for his faith. Here before the authorities, the apostles' doctrines were misstated. False witnesses accused him of teaching seditious heresies. By these accusations, his enemies hoped to bring about the disciples' death. John answered for himself in a clear and convincing manner and with such simplicity and candor that his words had a powerful effect. His hearers were astonished at his wisdom and eloquence. But the more convincing his testimony, the deeper was the hatred of his opposers. Can, you interrupt, can I interrupt for a moment? 
Do you think God spoke to John on occasions like that and to Paul and others? I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it, this kind of thing happened to Paul, too. You know, witnessing before Nero, witnessing for a Domitian. And you would, have, you would have thought that, you know, there wouldn't, be, there wouldn't be anything you could say that would have any impact on those people. But look, look at these words. Yeah, yeah. The Emperor Domitian was filled with rage. He could neither dispute the reasoning of Christ's faithful advocate nor match the power that attended his utterance of truth. Yet he determined that he would silence his voice. Okay. Yeah. Myra, you want to take Everything the next one? Everything is okay. John was cast into the cauldron of boiling oil. Okay. We'll but the him Lord him. preserved the life of him. his faithful servant. Okay. Okay. Even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace, as the words were spoken, thus perished, thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, John declared. My master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels would devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored to be in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am weak and I am a weak and sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Charles, you want to take the next one there? Yes. These words had their influence, and John was removed from the caldron by the very men who had cast him in. Can you imagine being thrown in? I mean, how hot does oil have to get to boil? Really, really hot. And here's these guys throwing John in. Okay, that takes care of that. No. What? Mm, didn't happen. <laughs> Not happening. He wouldn't cook. He didn't cook. Okay. Again, the hand of persecution fell heavily upon the apostle. By the emperor's decree, John was banished to the Isle of uh, Patmos, condemned for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1, 9. Here, his enemies thought his influence would no longer be felt and he must finally die of hardship and distress. Wow. Gordon? Continuing from Acts of the Apostles still. Patmos, a barren rocky island in the Aegean Sea, had been chosen by the Roman government as a place of banishment for criminals. But to the servant of God, this gloomy abode became the gate of heaven. Here, shut away from the busy scenes of life and from the active labors of former years, he had the companionship of God and Christ and the heavenly angels and from them he received instruction for the church for all future time. The events that would take place in the closing scenes of this earth's history were outlined before him, and there he wrote out the visions he received from God. Wow. When his voice could no longer testify to the one whom he loved and served, the messages given him on that barren coast were to go forth as a lamp that burneth, declaring the sure purpose of the Lord concerning every nation on the earth. Among the cliffs and rocks of Patmos, John held communion with his maker. He reviewed his past life, and at thought of the blessings he had received, peace filled his heart. So this is not restless, not... No, no longer son of thunder. That's son right. Thunder. He had lived the life of a Christian, and he could say in faith, we know that we have passed from death unto life, 1 John 3, 14. Mm -hmm. Not so the emperor who had banished him. He could look back only on fields of warfare and carnage, on desolated homes, on weeping widows and orphans, the fruit of his ambitious desire for preeminence. In his isolated home, John was able to study more closely than ever before the manifestations of divine power as recorded in the book of nature and in the pages of inspiration. Now, do you suppose that he as a supposedly accused criminal banished by the Roman government, the Isle of Patmos, was able to take any documents with him, any scriptures with him, or did he memorize the scripture? I suspect he had it memorized. Very possible. Portions anyway. Yeah. We're pretty sure that Paul had. 
To him, it was a delight to meditate on the work of creation and to adore the divine architect. In former years, his eyes have been greeted by the sight of forest-covered hills, green valleys, and fruitful plains. And in the beauties of nature, it had ever been his delight to trace the wisdom and skill of the Creator. He was now surrounded by scenes that to many would appear gloomy and uninteresting. But to John, and I, I mean, I don't know what the Isle of Patmos looked like in, in those days, but I wouldn't say it was so bad now. It's pretty rocky, but it's also, you know, quite a few trees and so forth. But to John it was otherwise. While his surroundings might be desolate and barren, the blue heavens that bent above him uh, were as bright and beautiful as the skies above his loved Jerusalem. In the wild, rugged rocks and the mysteries of the deep and the glories of the firmament, he read important lessons. All bore the message of God's power and glory. Jim, you want to take the next one there? All around him the apostle beheld witnesses to the flood that had deluged the earth, because the inhabitants ventured to transgress, excuse me, ventured to transgress the law of God. The rocks thrown up from the great deep and from the earth by the breaking forth of the waters brought vividly to his mind and terrors of this awful <coughs> outpouring of God's wrath. Carrie? The history of John affords a striking illustration of the way in which God can use aged workers. When John was Do we have any of those here? <laughs> no. uh. <laughs> when John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, there were many who thought him to be past service, an old and broken reed, ready to fall at any time. But the Lord saw fit to use him still. Though banished from the scenes of his former labor, he did not cease to bear witness to the truth. Even in Patmos, he made friends and converts. Now, I want to stop there. That's a very significant statement by Ellen White. Yes. Uh, there is a lot of discussion among scholars about the book of Revelation. How did, where did, where did Paul get this big, long John. scroll? I'm sorry, John, get this big, long scroll. Those things are very expensive. Yeah. I mean, they're made out of, in his day, it was probably made out of unborn animal skins. And where did he, I mean, did he write it out himself? Did he get somebody to help him? Well, maybe here's a clue. He made friends and converts. And how did, how did he get the document away from Patmos back over to Ephesus, for example? By ship. Guard number seven became a convert. There you are. <laughs> Guard number 12 uh, took it all away. Yes. Very Maybe. possible. Hmm. Okay, go ahead. Where were we? I can't... His, at the end of the bold, his, his was a message. His was a message of joy proclaiming a risen Savior who on high was interceding for his people until he should return to take them to himself. Let me interrupt for just a second again. What other famous apostle do we know who conver converted his jailers? Yeah, of course, Paul. Oh, oh. oh in Rome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it was after John had grown old in the service of his Lord that he received more communications from heaven than he had received during all the former years of his life. Wow. That's by Ellen G. White from Acts of the Apostles page 569 through 572. Wow. Does that mean that in his later years he received more than those three and a half years with Jesus himself? More, more re direct communications from, from heaven. Well, Jesus was direct from yeah. heaven. Yeah, true. I guess it, but they're, they're, I think they're, they're separating from, from that. I just wanted to say something. Uh, when you hear these words, you could tell this is Ellen White. Not mm -hmm. even, yeah. you know, I mean, no one else writes That's, so beautifully. Yeah. Well, we do not know the exact conditions under which John saw and heard his visions. Revelation 1, 9 through 19 gives us some details. Um, I'm not going to take time to read those right now. Um, how do you think John felt about seeing his friend Jesus again? Remember, he, he, he sees a bunch of lampstands, and then he sees someone standing there with that long white robe on and a gold belt around his middle and so forth. 
he was about to unfold to John an interesting set of visions, not just one vision, multiple visions, suggesting many things that would take place involving the Christian church primarily from his day until the second coming and beyond. So how do you think John felt about receiving that first vision? I mean, what would you do if you got a vision like that and you, you felt like com you were compelled to try to share it? Yeah. And you're in prison on an island miles and miles from anybody. I'd have to share it with the guards. Yeah. yeah. And he Especially did. Especially those that had been converted, that yeah. had showed some interest before. Yeah, I think he would get some comfort out of that. And when you think where he was, who's to say they weren't bringing him food and stuff by boat all the time? Mm -hmm. Well, who was the one who visited John to give him these visions? Christ. Do we remember? Is it Gabriel or was it? No. Maybe we better go back and look. Revelation 1. I, this is... This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what Yes, it is. exactly. So it's Jesus himself. Um, and look at down here. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead... Um, sorry. Like a dead man. Like a dead man. I, I'm, That's what it's got there. Yeah. He placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Who speaks like that? I am the living one. I was dead, but now I am alive forever and ever. Do we have to read any more? I have authority over death and the world of the dead. This was Jesus himself that was appearing to, to John. And he makes a very interesting, some interesting statements that if we had a long time we would we'd look at. So Jesus wasn't just there to make a friendly visit. He was about to unfold to John an interesting set of visions suggesting many things that would take place involving the Christian church from his day until the second coming and beyond. Remember, in that, John was the only one in the Bible who knew anything about the millennium. So this, his visions extended, two, I mean, a thousand years and more beyond the last thing that anybody else knew about in the Bible, in Bible times. And yet, it is perhaps the most ignored. Yeah book um, by most of the churches. Think of everything that he had been through. Sometimes we feel that things are difficult in our day. Have you been thrown in a pot of boiling oil? But have we been through anything even close to what the apostles, especially Paul, had experienced? After his final days in the Temple Mount, Jesus made that astounding statement that raised questions in the minds of his disciples. Matthew 24, verse 2. I tell you this, not a single stone here will be left in its place. Every one of them will be thrown down from my Good News Bible. When they reached the Mount of Olives that evening, they asked, his disciples asked Jesus, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Matthew 24, verse 3. What was God's purpose in revealing the visions of Revelation to John? Was God's plan so that especially the final generation of us living on this earth would be prepared for what is coming just before his return? I think you understand my question. Is, was that vision given to John on the Isle of Patmos primarily for us living in our generation? What do you think? Are you suggesting that it wasn't mm -hmm. directly for John? It was for 2,000 years later? Well... I'm just asking. You're suggesting that, I think. If any one of us, and I don't want to imply that I'm anywhere close to John in my relationship with Christ, but to be able to project 2,000 years later, mm. yeah. I mean, I've, I've thought many times what, it, what it's going to be like when we're all raised and together and how we're going to be able to communicate mm -hmm. just communication yeah but the culture and the there's so many differences how, how did john is that why revelation is somewhat difficult to well let's take an example where do we read in the bible about the seven last plagues it's in revelation only in revelation 
And we're all looking forward to the seven last plagues, right? <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> Not exactly. Well, it, only, only in that it means that the end is near. Yes. Well, Seventh-day Adventists know what Daniel said 500 years before John. Let's see, I think that's yours, Jim. Daniel ch chapter 12, verse 1. The angel wearing the linen clothes at that time, the great angel Michael, who guards your people, will appear. Then there will be a time of troubles, the worst since nations first came into existence. When that time comes, all the peoples of the nations whose names are written in God's book will be saved. And I like that. That is not a bad translation. I like the NIV in that one place where it says, your protector. Uh -huh. I, 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 I kind of like that. Yeah. And it will not be just be difficulties in the physical world. Notice these words recorded by Matthew. Carrie? Uh, Matthew 24, 4 through 8, 23 through 31. Jesus answered, Be on your guard, and do not let anyone deceive you. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many people. You are going to hear the noise of battles close by and the news of battles far away, but do not Does be... Does that troubled. happen in our day? Yes. <laughs> Such things must happen, but they do not mean that the end has come. Let me interrupt again for just a second. Um, Adventists didn't make very much of a big deal about this, but I thought it was pretty amazing. About three years ago, I think now, the National Geographic magazine, which is all into evolution and all that kind of stuff, but it reports things that they think are interest, interesting to people around. They had an entire article, several pages in their magazine, about different people around the world who claimed to be Jesus, claimed to be God. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. I remember that. Okay. But it's not just those people. They're preachers in almost every pulpit who claim to speak for God mm -hmm. every week. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was talking to the Lord last night, the guy says. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know. And what do we have to base that upon except his, his mutterings? Yeah. Such things must happen, but they do not mean that the end has come. Countries will fight each other, kingdoms will attack one another. There will be famines and earthquakes everywhere. All these things are like the first pains of childbirth. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. Listen, I have told you this before the time comes. Let me interrupt again. <clears throat> How many of, we, of these kind of guys have we seen actually I mean, this, this suggests that they're going to literally perform miracles. And I'm sure that would, it would have to be by the power of the devil. Yeah. But, I mean... There are lots of people, claim, lots of preachers, we'll call them, claiming to perform healings in the name of God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or if people should tell you, look, he is out on the desert, don't go there. Or if they say, look, he is hiding here, don't believe it. For the Son of Man will come like the lightning which flashes across the whole sky from the east to the west. Wherever there is a dead body, the vultures will gather. Soon after the trouble in those of those days, the sun will grow dark, the moon will no longer shine, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers in space will... Can you lift it a little? All right. Be driven from their courses. What does that mean? What are the powers in space? Let me mention something here. Have you seen in the news recently, and this has never been done by the U.S. military much before, we've all heard of Foo Fighters. They're showing those on the news right now. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be satanic. Uh -huh. There's something there. 
we can't have we don't have aircraft that can do this mm -hmm, yeah. kind of business. Yeah. The devil's going to come out of one of those one day. Yeah. Wow. The powers in space. Wow. Yeah. Usually called UFOs. Huh? Yeah. Mm. Well, Foo Fighters too. That's another Air Force thing about them. And they, World War Two, they were seeing this kind of thing, and nobody really believed it, but they're starting to believe now. They're mm -hmm. actually showing it on the screen. Yeah, exactly. I saw it a couple of days ago. Yeah. On TV. How can you overcome that kind of inertia with anything that humans know? We don't have anything. Yeah. How about holograms? Yeah. Well. Yeah, they could be. Yeah, they, you, I mean, you could if you're if you're talking about something that's controlled electronically, and not any physical mass, you can move it around in all kinds of crazy ways. But the if you have the whole world is. Yeah. Still alive, still functioning. Yep. Revelation twelve nine. So, that's a pretty yeah. broad uh, brush. I think the military's got a department for watching that now. I heard that somewhere recently. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the military is looking out for the devil. Keep your eyes tuned. Yeah. Well, get your eyes tuned to the scripture because. Yes. It's going to be very difficult to distinguish between Satan's fakes and, and the real true God. I think we need to go back a little bit where you have emphasized this again and again as the lightning flashes from the east to west. west. Mm -hmm. The Lord comes, it's going to be this way. And other, if, we had, a, if we had a chance to read the, that very carefully and look at other passages related to it, we would discover that when Jesus comes, all the angels will be with him. So, you know, there's been discussion, well, you know, when Jesus comes, will you know for sure it's the real Jesus because his feet touch the ground or they don't touch the ground? No, you don't have to bother with all that kind of stuff. You just look up. If the entire sky is full of bright shining angels, you know it's the real Jesus. If it's not, it's not the real Jesus. And Very simple. Everywhere and, at once. Yeah. All around the world. Yeah. Okay. Then the sign of the Son of Man? Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the peoples of earth will weep as they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, let me just interrupt again. I'm sorry I keep interrupting here. We read there the Son of Man, of course, is capitalized there, and we immediately say Jesus. Actually, the term Son of Man in Hebrew means a human being. So, the one who appears is, is, is going to look like a human being. Of course, we know who it is. He is it is Jesus. But uh, that's an important point. Yes. The great trumpet will sound, and he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the world to the other. That's from the Good News Bible. Jesus tried to impress upon his disciples the seriousness of what he was saying by comparing the end times to the days of Noah. Matthew 24, 37 through 39, the coming of the Son of Man will be like what happened in the time of Noah. In the days before the flood, people ate and drank, men and women married. Up to the very day, Noah went into the boat. Yet, they did not realize what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. That is how it will be when the Son of Man comes. Wow. There wasn't exactly a big long warning, was there? No. It is interesting that just before those words Jesus had said, Matthew twenty four fourteen, Myra? And this good news about the kingdom will be, will be preached through all the world for a witness for all nation, to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay. Each one of us is expected to prepare ourselves for what is coming. So what does it mean to endure unto the end? It might seem like these momentous events affecting the entire world will be completely beyond our control. But do we have a special task that God wants us to do before the end can come? Seventh-day Adventists believe that our commission as a church 
is to reveal to the world the truth of Revelation 14, 6 to 12 and its implications. Gordon, you got a challenge here. The good news. <clears throat> Revelation 14, 6 through 12. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the people of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. That's good news, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A second angel followed the first one, saying, she, is, she has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immortal, immoral lust. Now, let me interrupt for just a second. You're going to get ready, getting ready to read, it, to read the third angel's message. Really, we should always study Revelation 13 before we study Revelation 14. <clears throat> Satan is the one who makes all kinds of accusations first, and he says, if you don't follow me, I, I will kill you. And this is God's response. Okay? So, you go back, uh, uh, what was it, verse uh, 7? It says, the time of judging. Uh -huh. It could be God's ju being judge, uh, judging of yeah. God rather than God doing the judging. Well, it's going to be both. Yeah. It's gonna, but it's, it's really important. For, it's, you know, it's, um, <clears throat> yeah. It's it's because every one of us judges God by our choices. Do we believe Satan and our daily activities and what we do? Are we tempted, and etc.? Or do we believe God? And each time we do that, we in effect are judging God. Bible in basic English uh, says uh, the hour of His judging has come. That you could mm -hmm. take that either way. Mm -hmm. So the first angel's message is good news. The second angel's message is pretty good news. How about the third? Okay. Verse 9. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels of the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, for anyone who has the mark of its name. And that's the good news. Yes, well, but remember, here we have two, the two sides. Satan, first of all, makes his claim. He says, unless you receive my mark, unless you do what I tell you to do, I, you're, I'm going to kill you. You're going to die. So God responds and said, no, the people who are going to die are the ones who receive Satan's mark. So which are we going to do? That's the question. So that's the good news. That's the good news. Verse 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Good news Bible. In the early days of Adventism, this message was preached loud and clear and often. Why is it that we, it is hardly heard now? Don't we believe in present truth? Don't we believe that the hour of God's judgment is now upon us? After what we... Is present truth? If it's truth, isn't it always truth? Well, yes is it and... relevant for today, present truth? It's, it's true that a certain person is present in the United States right now. Maybe five years or ten years from now, that's not going to be true. So there is present truth, even though, you know. So how was John able to project 2,000 years later? There you go. Obviously, John didn't do it. Well, yeah. God did it too, John. But no, it's, you're right. Exactly. So if you read Revelation 13 first, you need to warn, God needs to warn those around us. We need to learn, we need to understand it and then warn others around us, our co-workers and our neighbors, about what happens to those who do not listen to God's warnings and will experience the third angel's message. Are we doing that? Why does God find it necess necessary to let us go through these horrendously challenging times before he comes again? 
couldn't he just take us home before the seven last plagues? And what do we call that? The rapture? Yeah. Many people claim that, don't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. Nevertheless, surely the best good news that we could get is that God is waiting to welcome us home to live with him forever. But what about those who do not survive to see Jesus coming in the clouds? What does the Bible tell us about the dead saints? The dead in Christ shall rise first. Hebrews 11, that's 1 Timothy 4. Uh, Hebrews 11, 13 to 16. It was in faith that all these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised. See, they died, they did not receive. What, what do our Christian friends say? When you die, you either go yeah. to heaven or to hell, right? Yeah. Now, these people are called saints. So they should be where? They should be in heaven. They did not receive the things God had promised. But from a long way off, they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. They do not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Instead, it was a better country they longed for, the heavenly country. And so God is not ashamed for them to call him their God because he has prepared a city for them from the Good News Bible. And it's interesting to note that even the wicked angels are waiting their judgment. Jude 6. Jim? Jude 6. Remember the angels who did not stay within the limits of their proper authority but abandoned their own dwelling place. They were bound with eternal chains in the darkness below where God is keeping them for the great day on which they will be condemned. So there's a judgment day coming, right? These verses really do not make sense if you think that people go directly to heaven or to hell when they die. I mean, if you're already in heaven, I mean, how, how crazy would that be? I mean, is God going to say to go do a final judgment and he's going to go, I'm sorry, you, you people, you five people or ten people, however many in heaven, you were really supposed to be down there. Bye. Or the people down here, oh, I'm so sorry. You, you've been suffering through all this stuff. You, you weren't supposed to be here. You're supposed to be in heaven. What's no. been a com computer glitch? A computer glitch. <laughs> God doesn't make mistakes in his judgment. <laughs> So these verses really do not make sense if you think that people go directly to heaven or to hell when they die. If people have already gone to their reward, these two passages do not make any sense. Many people when looking at cemeteries notice that there is a familiar acronym, RIP, which means what? Requiescat in pace. Rest, what? Requiescat in pace. It's yes. Italian. It's close. It's not yeah. totally right. Rest in peace. Yeah. Why do people write that? Do they recognize that the one who was buried there is asleep? Or do they really think that per that person is either in heaven or hell? That would not be resting in peace, would it? If you're in hell, for sure. No. In John 11, the story of the resurrection of Lazarus is told in some detail. Jesus made it very clear that death in his, in his eyes is just a temporary sleep, and he plans to wake us up. Okay? I think, Charles, is that you? Might be me. I think. Oh, okay, Gary. I'm just thinking about what we, yeah. we're talking about. <laughs> in John 11, the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. Well, you can drop down to the next paragraph. Okay. Uh, to the believer, death is but a smaller matter. Christ speaks of it as if it were of a little moment. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death, he shall never taste death. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's from... John 8, 51, 52, Colossians 3, 4, and The Desire of Ages by Ellen White, pages 787. Jesus made it quite clear that someday both the saved and the lost will be resurrected. Are they going to be resurrected at the same time? 
No. 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 The, saved. the saved will be resurrected at the second coming. Yeah. The lost will be resurrected at the third, third coming. coming. So, what does the scripture say? John uh, 528, 28, uh, 29. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. Okay, notice the future tense. Yes. Those who have died will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done evil will rise. Those who have done evil, uh, I mean, those who have done good will rise and live. Those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. So Jesus is saying, what? All those people that are in their graves are still there, right? Yeah. Many people in the more advanced nations of the world find that GPS maps help them to find wherever they are looking for. Is John's message in the book of Revelation something like that? How do we use the GPS? You get in your car, you punch a few numbers there, then the address, it says go here, turn right, turn left, da da da. For those of you who have never had that experience, it's marvelous. Yeah. It, uh, I unfortunately, we have traveled to Europe and other places where you couldn't read the signs and so forth, and my poor wife would have to try to give directions. And she's looking at the map, and, and I'm trying to figure out how to drive. Oh, man, she would just about lose her sanity trying to figure out what those... I tried to go, there were two cars of us trying to go about two miles from a car rental place back to the hotel uh -huh. and we got lost so bad because not every street was on the map mm -hmm. well go three blocks and then turn left well it's a one-way street you can't turn you know, uh, yeah. yeah and we got <laughs> separated from each other and well, who, who gave these directions was it written was it written out no it was a we, we had maps uh -huh. okay yeah yeah. Long you know, and it. yeah. One time we spent. The, yeah, this is this is back in the dark ages yeah. before GPS was uh, used yeah. by. We spent us we spent an hour one time trying to get into the Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. Yeah. We went around and around. I mean, you know, this is a major airport. You think you get on the freeway, it'll drive straight to the airport, right? Oh no. Now maybe it's like that now. I haven't been there recently, but. Oof. Brother. Well, what would you say about God, God to John is giving us here in Revelation? Is it a, is it a clear map? Wow. Is it as good as GPS? Or is it just sort of a general outline? Well, that requires a lot of study in the book of Revelation, doesn't it? As we see difficult things happening, many of us are inclined to experience a lot of worry and doubt. Paul gave words for us. Jim? Myra. Myra. I'm sorry, Myra. Uh, Philippians 4, 4 to 6. May you always be joyful in your union with the Lord. I say again, rejoice. Show a gentle, a gentle attitude towards everyone. The Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. But in all your prayers, ask God for what you need always asking him with a thankful heart. Hmm. Okay, should we indeed stop worrying about things because we know that the coming of Jesus is near, is soon? It is amazing that Paul can make a statement like that. No, nothing to worry about, just relax, good, rest, be thankful heart. Do we know what Paul had been through? 2 Corinthians eleven twenty one to 33. But if anyone dares to boast about something, I am talking like a fool, I will be just as daring. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I am a better servant than they are. Let's interrupt for just a second. These are people who are going around behind, behind Paul and telling people, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to follow all the Jewish rules. You've got to be circumcised, you've got to da-da-da-da. 
and Paul heard about it, he went back to Corinth to say, no, it's not true. And they hardly listened. They didn't want to listen to him. And he was so, he, he was just crushed. He went back to Ephesus and he said, what am I going to do? And this letter almost certainly as a result of that experience. <laughs> Go ahead. But I'm a better servant than they are. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I have been whipped much more. And I have been near death much more, more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Okay, let's interrupt for a second. Why is it 39 lashes? Because 40, 40 were supposed to kill you. 40 was supposed to kill you. Five times I was given the 39 lashes. Just okay. short of death. Three times I was whipped by the Romans, and once I was stoned and left for dead, by the way. Yes. I have been in three shipwrecks. And this is before the, the shipwreck that we know about. And once I spent 24 hours in the water, again, before what we know yeah. about. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers, in danger from fellow Jews. Can you imagine that? Yeah. And from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers in the high seas, dangers from false friends. There has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing, and not to mention other things. Every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. If I must boast, I will boast about things that show how weak I am. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, blessed be his name forever, knows that I am not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Eretus placed guards at the city gates to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through an opening in the wall and escaped from him. Okay, so he sends this message to Corinth. And he, there's all the people over in Corinth that are saying, we're, we're better apostles than Paul. We, we've been to it. I, I, just, I just wonder when they read this, they thought, he what? All that stuff? And these people are claiming to be better apostles than Paul? I, I, I hope they ran him out of town. So what should be our attitude? And what should be our relationship to God in these troublous times? We all desire immediate and direct answers to our prayers. I mean, isn't that the right thing to do? And are tempted to become discouraged when the answer is delayed or comes in an unlooked for form. But God is too wise and good to answer our prayers always at just the time and in just the manner we desire. He will do more and better for us than to accomplish all our wishes. And because we can trust his wisdom and love, we should not ask him to concede to our will, but should seek to enter into and accomplish his purpose. Our desires and interests should be lost in his will. Wow. Mm. Gospel Workers, Ellen White, page 219, paragraph 1. Jim? It will only be a little while before Jesus will come to save his children and to give them the finishing touch of immortality. The graves will be opened and the dead will come forth victorious, crying, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Our loved ones who sleep in Jesus will come forth clothed with immortality. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, April 15, 1889. Okay. The great controversy, as we mentioned back at the beginning, is very real. In fact, it is much more real than many realize because many in our world today do not believe in the existence of a literal devil. I'm talking theologians who don't believe in the existence of a real devil. I mean, I don't know how you can read the Bible and, and come up with that kind of a conclusion. And they don't, most of them don't understand the issue is over what kind of a God is, what is, what is the character of God? I mean, who has any questions about the character of God? We need to avoid, however, the attempt to set a specific time when Jesus will come again. Think of all those who have set dates 
and been wrong. So let's not make that mistake. One of the issues that is hotly debated even in Adventist circles is whether or not anything that we do can either hasten or delay the second coming. So which is it? Is God waiting for us or are we waiting for him? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's the right answer. Okay. Second, I'm reading from Second Peter chapter 3, 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. Does that sound like we have a portion something to do? Yes, sir. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat from the Good News Bible. Yeah. So, so that certainly supports that we, something that we do, <coughs> may hasten and or delay God's coming. Ellen White said it clearly many times yes. that God, God has had to delay his coming from back in the 1860s even. Yep, exactly. 1883, she said we should have been in the kingdom by now already. 150 years. Well, we all believers are the best known uh, hostage keepers. We, we have in our hands the hostage who is Christ. He says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, and then shall the end come. Yes. So I wish more and more uh, Adventist preachers were uh, preaching about the hostage, hostage takers. Mm -hmm. We are the hostage takers. Yep. So are we prepared to deal with everything the devil is going to throw at us before the second coming? Do we clearly understand the warnings of Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13? And those chapters are more or less parallel. Do we understand what is implied by the prophecies of Revelation? Are we prepared to give the message of Revelation 14, 6 to 12 to the world around us? Sometimes great trials need to come in order to re reveal who is honest, true, and faithful, and who is not. That will be true at the end of this worst history as well. Aren't you glad that we have the book of Revelation? In this book, we are told that Jesus will interact with us, help us, and then finally come to save us. I mean, Jesus, when he, he went to heaven, he, wasn't, he, wasn't, he didn't abandon us. Jesus compared the second coming in some respects to what happened at the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at these comments from various scholars about that experience. Charles, I think that's yours. The Jewish historian Josephus describes the devastating effects of the siege. He says this that- This is the, the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem yeah. 70. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He says that the starving people would often come to blows over a small piece of bread Children would often rip food from their parents' mouths. Neither brother nor sister had mercy upon the other. A bushel of corn was more precious than gold, the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay. Um, there were instances during the siege in which parents boiled their children who had died and ate them. Josephus goes on. This is not an Adventist or author. This is Josephus himself. Yes. Uh, goes on. Deliver, driven by hunger, some ate manure, some the sin. sin These are the, the leather, the leather attachments of the saddles. Saddles. Some the leather strips from their shields. Some still had hay in their mouths when their bodies were found. Wow. wow. The effects of the attack on Jerusalem by the Romans were gruesome and devastating. Before it was over, fire broke out and thousands more died in the flames. Adult Teacher, Sabbath, Bible, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 172. 
And I will tell you again, on one of those trips I made to the Middle East, we actually went down to a place where they said oh, it's too difficult to go through there. But I went through there, and there it was a waterway that was, that was prepared to try to <clears throat> supply water to a town that was right, I mean, clear, good water down to a town that was on the coast of the Mediterranean. <clears throat> and there on the wall was carved the name, I mean, original thing, from Titus, the one who conquered Jerusalem on that occasion. It's there, it's just a clear sign. This, this waterway was produced by da da da, and whatever. Well, the disciples had a very interesting experience with Jesus. How many of them would have stayed with him if he had told them at the very beginning that most of them would end up being martyrs? They thought they were signing up to be in charge of a great Jewish government that would rule the world. They ended up believing that they would be a part of a greater government with their names on the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. Wow. Do we clearly understand the progress of events that are prophesied to take place before the second coming? God is waiting for us to do our part and preach the gospel. Paul spent the last several years of his life imprisoned with only a brief period of time when he was released just before his release from the prison in Rome. Paul wrote a letter to the Philippians in which he was rejoicing. In this first chapter, he talked about joy and trials. The second chapter seems to be talking about joy and humility. In chapter three, he saw joy and surrender. And finally, in chapter four, he saw joy and gratitude. Unfortunately, many of us have had the experiences, have, ex have, to, have had to experience the death of family or friends or acquaintances. These <clears throat> are times of mourning but if those friends were faithful Christians, we believe that they will only have to be, a, that will only have to be a temporary sleep. Are we prepared for, uh, to be trusting and trustworthy? Are we prepared to speak the truth about God whenever we have opportunity to see how that might help to finish the gospel? If you look at the records in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy and you study them very carefully, you'll see that Probation is closed by us. God doesn't come until each person on this earth has made a decision for him or for the devil. So what are you going to decide? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this set of lessons. We thank you for the guidance we get from the book of Revelation and from places like Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and Mark 13. May we be drawn nearer to as we study these things is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.